you all for joining Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's the Wednesday, March 17th, 2021, Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. I'm Chairperson Ashley Stolzman, and we're holding this meeting electronically and recording it because of COVID-19. And so um, we will do a roll call, but before we do that, I would just like to introduce <clears throat> um, our new members. And of course, my notes. There we go. And we have um, a new member, Webb Sill from Gilpin County. So welcome. And that is it for this evening. And so with that, I will ask Melinda Stevens to do a roll call, please. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And here we go. All right, Aaron Brockett. Present. Adam Cushing. Present. <clears throat> Allison Coombs. Mike Kaufman. Bill Gipp. Present. Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott. Bud Starker. I'm here. This is Bob. I oh, closed. thank you, Bob. I promoted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And Bud Starker? Yes, ma'am. All right. Claire Levy. Here. Colleen Whitlow. Um, I know that she did write to me and we have added her. She's just having some technical difficulties. So Colleen is present. Um, David Spellman. <clears throat> Deborah Mulvey. Here. John Cognac. David Whelan. George Lance. Dave Kerber. Here. George Teal. Present. Uh, Herb Atchison? Yes. Jacob LeBure? Dana Gutwein? Jim Dale? Here. Uh, James Kumerly? Jamie Jeffrey? Jason Gray? Here. Jeff Baker? Bill Holland, Jessica Sandgren, I'm here, Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, John Dyack, here, Josie Cockrell, Lisa Jones, Julie Duran Mullica, Joyce Downing, Kara Tanucci, Jeremy Fay, Karina Elrod, Pamela Gro. Oh, I'm sorry, was that Karina? Karina Elrod? Okay, maybe we're just getting feedback. Uh, Pamela Grove. Katherine Whitman, Jackie Thomas, Kevin Flynn. I'm here. Christopher Larson, Larry Vidum. Here. Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, Linda Olson. Happy St. Patrick's Day from Linda Olson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Lynette Kelsey? Here. <laughs> Margo Ramson? Here. Michael Hillman? Neil Shaw? Here. Nicholas Angelo? Holly Rogan? Present. Nicholas Williams? Here. Nicole Frank, Craig Hurst, Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, <coughs> Rachel Binkley, present, Randy Wheel, glad to be here, 
Randy Wheelock. George Marlin. Roy Palmer. Gail Christie. Sally Daigle. Stephanie Walton. Sally's here. Hello. Oh, thank you, Sally. And thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Steve O'Dericio. Lynn Baca. Steve Conklin. Here. Tammy Mauer. Here. Tracy Kraft Tharp. Yes. Webb Sill. William Lindstedt. Here. And Winshaw. Here. All right. Thank you all so much. And with that, Madam Chair, we have a quorum and I will hand it back to you. So I'll just recognize Allison Coombs and Catherine Whitman both joined while we were doing the roll call and they're both here. And um, if you'd like to make a comment beyond that, keep your hand raised and I will call on you still. Otherwise you can put your hand down. Thank you. And then other folks who have made it in, Celeste Arner and Josie Cockrell are also both in attendance. Um, just make sure we mark them down. If anyone else is here and wasn't able to um, be called in roll call, just go ahead and please raise your hand at this time and we'll make sure you're a panelist and that we have you marked down for attendance. So it looks like we have one more and that's Bill Van Meter has joined us as well. Um, so Bill, keep your hand up if you have a comment and I'll call on you otherwise. Okay, great. All right, anyone else here that hasn't had a chance? Rebecca White is also here. Great. Thank you so much. And if we've missed anyone, um, just go ahead and email. Oh, Steve Odoriso, Odoricio is also here. And thank you so much. If we've missed anyone else, we can um, handle it through email after the meeting and make sure that we accurately reflect the attendance in the record. With that, I'll ask someone to make a motion to approve the agenda. Please raise your hand um, to speak. We just have so many folks, it really helps if people raise their hand. And at Winshaw, Director Shaw. to approve the agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay, uh, Director Flynn. I second the motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Is there any opposition? Thank you, the agenda is approved. That takes us to our public hearings for this evening. Um, so we have two public hearings tonight. <clears throat> and our first public hearing <clears throat> is a public hearing on the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan or the 2050 MVRTP and associated air quality conformity, conformity determinations. Good evening to all. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors. I thank you all for participating tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated air quality conformity documents. The public hearing is the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of the hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in our documents. I, I just noted uh, the documents I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made this evening and no actions will be taken related to the public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the board's decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak should raise your hand using the Zoom interface. If you've joined by phone, you'll press star nine to raise your hand. All comments that we've received by email, the Dr. Cog website or in writing have automatically been included in the public hearing for the record. Comments received prior to the public hearing have already been provided to board members. If you uh, wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record for this public hearing, please email it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those who are testifying. Jacob Rieger and Alvin Vidal Sanchez of Dr. Cog staff will now summarize the draft 2050 regional transportation plan. Jacob. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board Directors. Give me just a moment to bring up our presentation. Oh, 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Jacob Rieger. I'm the Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Uh, with me to do this short presentation is my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, before I get into the presentation, just a note to our board directors. Um, this public hearing concludes our 30 day public comment period on the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. The 30 day public comment period actually ended at 5 p.m. this evening. Um, so at 5.01 p.m. we started scrambling uh, to put together all of the comments um, and all the input that we had received over the last 30 days. Um, and that was emailed to you prior to the board meeting. Um, in the old days, meaning pre-pandemic, uh, we would have actually put those at your seat uh, when we were meeting together in person. <clears throat> um, so um, those were really hot off the press um, for you all to take a look at. Those, all the comment that we received will be part of um, the public record for the public comment that we had during this 30 day period. And it will also be part of the documentation that we include uh, when we bring the plan forward, the revised plan forward in April um, to ask for adoption of the plan. So with that, uh, just a really short presentation to uh, just kind of talk about what is uh, the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So first of all, um, in terms of the documents that are the subject of this public hearing this evening, it is the plan document itself, the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan that included a main plan document of four chapters, and it also included 19 appendices. Um, yes, there's a lot of information in the plan. One of those appendices deals specifically with our federal requirements regarding air quality conformity determination. Um, that is a key part of um, sort of the preparation and adoption of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, as well as the other public hearing that we will have this evening on uh, the transportation improvement program. So I just wanted to highlight the inclusion of the air quality conformity determination documents as well. Um, just a reminder of kind of our overall planning framework um, at Dr. Cog and where the plan fits in. Um, so obviously our overall plan, our aspirational vision plan for the region is the Metro Vision Plan. And then beneath that is the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, which we're discussing this evening in this public hearing. Um, as it says, it's a 20 plus year, in this case, a 30 year uh, sort of vision transportation plan, and I'll talk more about it in a moment. But it's really one of the key ways, uh, one of the key tools to help implement um, the overall Metro Vision Plan. And then from the Regional Transportation Plan, um, included, excuse me, included in uh, the overall <clears throat> 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan is a piece of it that's known as the Fiscally Constrained Regional Transportation Plan. That's some federal terminology that basically just means what portion of the overall plan and what portion of our overall vision, um, what component of that is actually what we think that we can collectively pay for based on all of the revenues uh, coming to this region over the next 30 years. So it's really that cost feasible piece of the long range transportation plan. Um, and then um, is the transportation improvement program, which again will be the subject of the second public hearing this evening. The transportation improvement program is a four year program of funded projects. So the long range plan that we're talking about now is a 30 year document the Transportation Improvement Program um, is a four-year document of funded projects. Um, as I said, both the, both the Regional Transportation Plan and the Transportation Improvement Program are subject to air quality conformity, and those documents are included as part of this public hearing, but apply to both uh, the Long Range Plan and the Transportation Improvement Program. Also, just a reminder kind of about our planning area um, at Dr. Cog, uh, a couple things being shown on this map. Uh, the kind of greenish area is the area that we call our transportation management area. Um, again, that's another sort of fancy federal term. Basically what that means is that's the area that um, is part of our uh, planning designation as the region's metropolitan planning organization or MPO. Uh, we are the MPO for the Denver region. And as the MPO, we are charged federally with leading the multimodal transportation planning process in partnership with CDOT, Dr. Cog, local governments and other stakeholders uh, throughout the Denver region. So the area of the MPO boundary is the area that's shown in green, which is kind of our urban area uh, within the Denver region. Our Dr. Cog area also includes the areas in blue. Uh, so it's Eastern Adams and Arapahoe County and it's Clear Creek and Gilpin counties. Functionally for the purposes of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we prepared the regional plan for the entire Dr. Cog planning area. So including both the green and the blue. So what is the Regional Transportation Plan? Um, as I've started to allude in previous slides, it really is the long range vision for multimodal transportation planning in this region. It really sets that framework in terms of what projects and programs um, and other investments in our multimodal system are important in this region. 
Um, it brings together all of the revenues and all of the expenditures, regardless of where the dollars are coming from or who's spending those dollars, federal, state, local, uh, toll highway authorities, whatever it is, it's everything that goes into operating, maintaining, expanding, and improving the transportation system within the Denver region. Um, again, it sets that vision and that framework uh, for identifying investment priorities over the next 30 years. It is not a budget document. It is a long range plan, but it does identify major projects, programs, services, and other investments that are important uh, for this region to invest in. And those projects and investments get implemented over time through the transportation improvement program, through the work of local governments, CDOT, RTD, and other stakeholders. We update the plan. We do a major update every four years, and that's what we're doing now. Our adopted plan from 2017 is the 2040 plan. This update will bring it to a 2050 plan. During uh, in between four year updates, uh, we do amendment cycles on a more routine, maybe once a year as needed basis. Um, as I've said, we've developed this with our partners, RTD, CDOT, local governments, toll highway authorities, and all the partners that we work with throughout the region. And this plan um, also meets uh, numerous federal requirements um, that are placed on us as, as the metropolitan planning organization for this region. I've mentioned air quality conformity. The 2050 Regional Transportation Plan must address several pollutants, ozone, carbon monoxide, and what's known as particulate matter uh, pollutants. Air quality conformity for this plan is regional, meaning that it's not a project, project by project basis. It's for the entire plan and all of the project investments in the plan. So it's everything within um, this plan for the entire region and not based on individual projects. What are known as regionally significant transportation projects. So these are the large scale capacity projects, regardless of mode, whether they're roadway projects, uh, fixed guideway transit projects, other major projects are included in our regional travel model transportation network. Um, and it's that network that's used, um, again, all of the projects in the plan uh, to determine air quality conformity of this plan for the entire region. It is a primary federal requirement that the 2050 plan passes and it has what are known as pollutant emission tests for regional air quality conformity. All that means is that there are budgets that are set for us for these pollutants over the 30 years of the plan. Those budgets are set for us in what's known as the state implementation plan for air quality. And we have demonstrated in the 2050 regional transportation plan that we pass those pollutant emission tests. Um, in terms of our overall planning process to develop the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we started back in the summer of 2019. By the time the Dr. Cog Board approves the plan and our federal partners at the Federal Transit Administration, the Federal Highway Administration, review and certify this plan in June of this year, it will have been about a two year planning process. This graphic gives you a sense of the four major phases that we stepped through over the past two years and the timelines for those. Um, and also gives you a little bit of sense of some of the engagement activities um, that we use to develop this long range transportation plan. We used a variety of engagement techniques, um, obviously some pre COVID um, and especially post COVID to try and uh, try and engage uh, both our public and stakeholders in the Dr. Cog region. And then for the next couple of slides, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, Alvin. Thanks, Jacob. So we took what we heard from our public and stakeholder engagement across the last year and a half and have articulated six priorities in the RTP, multimodal mobility, air quality, regional transit, safety, active transportation, and freight. We tagged information across the plan and we've actually organized our investments and our outcomes around these six priorities. A unique part of our development in this 2050 RTP was in our project solicitation phase. When we went to our project sponsors, to get projects to evaluate and ultimately include in the plan. We also specifically asked for safety projects, active transportation projects and freight projects to reflect the importance we were hearing from our public and our stakeholders for these types of projects. So ultimately when we went through our interagency process, we were able to include safety projects, active transportation projects and freight projects in our plan. Another key component of our fiscally constrained projects are local projects. So those that are being completed by local governments and toll authorities. That concludes our presentation, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation this evening. The hearing is now open for those who've signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. <clears throat> um, if I can, I will share this. Um, I'm gonna stop your screen share there. There we go. Uh, so folks have an indication of how much time is remaining on the clock for them. 
Um, so you'll have three minutes. At, if um, you've not finished by the end of the three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not speak not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. So if folks would like to speak on this agenda item, you can raise your hand by clicking the raise hand feature at the bottom of your panel, or if you've dialed in by phone, please dial star nine so we can see a raised hand on your behalf. And we have a few folks in the queue, so I'll call you one at a time. First up is Andrea Shushaka. You should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I'm Andrea Suhaka. I live in Centennial and I've been to many, many meetings on this issue. I have to praise Mr. Rieger and Ms. Hood, who, who I've seen present this. I think they're tired of seeing me, but I think this is a wonderful plan. I agree with everything that I've seen in it. If this can come to fruition, this will greatly improve the Denver metro area, especially as regards to air quality. I do urge you all to, to please pass this plan when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Michael Scott Ramming. Uh, hello, this is Michael Scott Ramming, PhD, PE, and I'm speaking on my own behalf as a resident of Cole Neighborhood and RTD District C, and I'm not speaking for any organization or employer that I may be associated with. Uh, I wanted to notice that I saw in the 2050 Fiscally Constrained Project List that it contains the Beeline uh, Northwest Rail Extension uh, Peak Period uh, Service Plan and none of the other three uh, unfinished uh, fast tracks extensions, which be the, uh, those would be the CND line extension to Lucent Boulevard, the L line extension to 38th and Balake, and the N line extension to State Highway 7. Uh, I'm not able to find in the RTD's uh, board site uh, any record where they've taken a vote to put the B line in front of the other unfinished corridors. Uh, as opposed to I have seen resolutions where they make a generic commitment to complete all of the corridors. Uh, and I've even asked around, uh, former District D Director uh, Jeff Walker is also uh, unable to recall uh, voting on such a measure. And while using the B line might make sense for uh, conformity, uh, especially given that it's lower ridership relative to its cost, uh, which would presumably result in more auto travel and more emissions. Uh, I'm concerned that even though uh, conformity is determined regionally, it's individual projects that uh, become eligible for funding as a result of the plan adoption. Uh, if the RTD board wishes to select the B-Line first, that's exactly what they're elected for. Uh, but in the ideal world, the RTD board would make that decision before the Dr. Cog board. So I trust that the Dr. Cog board will be proceeding prudently and fully aware of the implied asterisk uh, besides RTD's uh, capital plan. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. The next speaker is Robert Greer. Hi there. Um, so this $8.2 billion I thought I saw, um, is, that, um, is that exclusive of car infrastructure or does that include any car infrastructure that might have um, some kind of bike lane window dressing or something like that? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Evan Derby. Hello, everybody. My name is Evan Derby. Uh, good afternoon. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to join you all this afternoon and express a, a bit of disappointment in the, the priorities that are actually reflected by this plan. Um, I can see that there's been some, uh, some definite interest in uh, finding different transit projects and different uh, multimodal projects and whatnot. But from the 
tally that I've done of the projects that are actually proposed here, um, it, it seems that there's quite a lot of projects that are proposing to expand roadway capacity. In fact, on uh, page 98, the, pro the proposal says that the the plan imagines a future where the capacity of the roadway network will be considerably changed. And based on the projects, it uh, seems to be considerably considerably changed for more roadway capacity. Now, as somebody who is definitely concerned about climate change, is concerned about vehicle emissions, um, it, it seems to me that roadway expansion is not the way that our state and our country will be able to overcome these issues with, uh, with climate change. And it seems kind of egregious to me that Dr. Cog has performed so much uh, public outreach. And in fact, in one of the appendices, there's a question about what the ideal priorities should be. And this question shows that the um, public feels that, at least 40% of the public feels that roadway expansion should get no funding and 35% of the public felt like roadway expansion should get low priority in terms of funding. So that's over 75% of respondents who said that roadway expansion should be a low or no priority item. And from what I can see, the plan includes many, many more roadway expansion projects than other projects. I'm also concerned about the timelines that are being proposed for some of these projects. I've seen between the regionally funded projects and the locally funded projects, there are over 160 projects that are roadway expansion that are proposed to start within the next 10 years. And when you move to the transit side, there are many BRT projects uh, proposed in this document, which I would be very excited to see, but only two of those are proposed to be started in the next 10 years. And so again, going back to being able to shift our focus away from cars, shift our focus away from emissions and pollution, I don't see how prioritizing this many roadway expansion projects is something that is in alignment with any of the priorities that uh, the plan uh, supposedly promotes or the plan that, or excuse me, the priorities that I as a human have for wanting to have a livable planet uh, for the next you know, 50 to, to 70 years that I'm alive. And I would appreciate Dr. Cog's board revising the plan to further reflect the importance of these priorities. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker this evening is Brandon Figliolino. Good evening. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak real quick. I just wanted to thank Dr. Cog's staff for all of their hard work this, with this plan. I was on uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee, so I've gotten to see it evolve throughout the past couple of years. I know they put a lot of work into the plan and working with stakeholders and residents and local governments. And while I am disappointed that there is a lot of roadway expansion projects in it, I'm really excited to see all of these transit and multimodal projects. And I hope that the future plans will continue to emphasize our uh, multimodal transportation and transit. So thanks again for all the hard work. Thank you. And um, I just, have a question out, um, Melinda and or Lisa, can I just confirm whether I have already called Robert Greer on this public hearing or not? Uh, yes, I believe you have. All right, so um, I'm just gonna confirm with Robert that he's had a chance to uh, say something. Each person gets one chance to speak for public hearing. So Robert, I just wanna confirm with you that you've had a chance to speak on this item. Uh, I did. I just wanted to echo everything Evan Derby said as well, just real quickly. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so seeing no other hands on this um, public hearing, I just want to give folks a chance to raise their hand if they had wanted to comment on this hearing. All right. Seeing no other questions, uh, we have one more speaker this evening. And so Robert, uh, Robin Kearns. Yes. Hi. Thank you for your time. Uh, and I appreciate your, your work here. I just wanted to echo the sentiment regarding the expansion or the less need to expand roadway, but taking a different tact and trying to think creatively as a uh, making lemonade, so to speak, could we consider some sort of, uh, you know, percent equity towards decommissioning some of our existing roadways in some of our communities at the same time to offset these increases, if that makes any sense. Uh, I appreciate your time again. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. Sorry. Just trying to do too many things at once. <clears throat> um, so are there any questions from board members at this time on this public hearing? Seeing no questions from board members, this brings tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. And that takes us to our next agenda item, which is the second public hearing. Good evening. I am Ashley Stolzman, chair, sorry, I have way too many screens open, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Government's Board of Directors. I thank you all for participating uh, tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the draft 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, and associated air quality conformity documents. The public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all the who are interested in the documents that I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decisions are being made this evening and no actions will be taken tonight related to the public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to our board and, and our decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak should raise your hand using the Zoom interface. If you've joined by phone, you'll press star nine to raise your hand. All comments received by email, the Dr. Cobb website or in writing have automatically been included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to the public hearing uh, have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit risk written testimony to be included in the official record for the public hearing, please email it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions to those who are testifying. Todd Cottrell of Dr. Cox staff will now summarize um, the draft 2022 to 2025 tip. Todd? All right, thank you everyone. Uh, let me get this going here. All right, um, so thank you and thank you, Madam Chair, for the introduction. Um, so echoing exactly what Jacob had just mentioned, um, this presentation um, does conclude the public hearing process for this evening um, for the 22 to 25 Transportation Improvement Program and the Air Quality Conformity Determinations. Um, this process uh, started uh, back on February 10th. So the two documents that are subject of the public hearing tonight, uh, of course, the 22 to 25 tip and the associated uh, the air quality conforming determinations, which of course, as Jacob mentioned, uh, contain the carbon monoxide, PM10 and ozone. Um, these air quality confirm, conformity determination documents are the same documents um, that are used for the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And these documents contain both uh, those projects plus the um, capacity projects that are contained within the transportation improvement program. Um, so the exact same planning process structure as you just saw um, in Jacob's previous presentation, but I think here um, the point is, is for the transportation and program, improvement program, it really implements the projects um, that are contained within the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Um, it's a, you know, it contains four years worth of funded projects that really implements this entire structure. Again, a very similar um, outline in which uh, was presented earlier. Um, here we have the transportation management area, uh, the TMA uh, that's outlined in the blue line. Um, this is basically mirrors the Dr. Cog boundary with the exception is that it does not include Gilpin, Clear Creek and the Eastern portions of Adams and Arapahoe. So what is the transportation improvement program? Um, so is it, this is a short term planning program that really identifies the, the real money that's involved and uh, within each individual project. Um, the, the federal funding and the state funding that's in, contained within these projects is fiscally constrained to all the sources of funding. Uh, TIPs are federally required through the FAST Act, which is the current federal transportation legislation. Um, according to the FAST Act, a transportation impro improvement program must be created at a minimum of every four years, uh, though Dr. Cog does create a new TIP every two years. Um, this is to maintain alignment with the statewide transportation improvement program, uh, or the STIP, which CDOT uh, creates. Um, it is important to point out that Dr. Cog projects are only selected every four years, so every two TIPs, so no new 
Dr. Cog call for projects was completed for this type, this tip cycle. Not only does it contain um, Dr. Cog projects, but also contains projects that were selected by CDOT and RTD. And of course, relating back to um, the process structure saw earlier, um, this does help implement the MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, again, the, the same slide that uh, was shown in Jacob's presentation for air quality conformity, um, just a couple of, of important items to point out. Um, the regionally significant projects that are contained in the TIP, um, also for the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, um, the conformity is run on these regional set of projects, again, not based on the individual projects. And of course, all pollution emission tests have been passed um, for the re regional air quality conformity. Uh, so that concludes the presentation I have and be happy to take any uh, comments and questions. Thank you very much, Todd. And so that um, will take us to the hearing. The hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Uh, each speaker will have three minutes to testify. If you've not finished by the end of the three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask you not re to repeat specific uh, points made by prior spe speakers, but rather a simple statement of agreement with prior testimonies acceptable and appreciated. Um, so you should be able to see a three minute timer now to help um, this will stop Todd's screen sharing. So you should be able to see a three minute timer now to help keep people on track. And if any members of the public would care to comment on this, go ahead and raise your hand at this time to sign up to speak. And if you've dialed in by phone, you'll just dial star nine and we'll be able to see a hand appear on your behalf. All right, seeing no hands raised at this time, give people one last chance to raise their hand. And that will bring tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you um, for everyone who participated and provided comments ahead of time and for those who participated in the hearing this evening. So now if I can only find my agenda, here we go. Thank you everyone. <laughs> so that takes us through our public hearings this evening and to agenda item six which is a strategic informational briefing. Metro Denver Homelessness Initiative Regional Efforts is attachment C in your packet if you're following along in the PDF. Dr. Jamie Reif, Director of Communications and Development for MDHI is going to take us through this informational briefing. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here tonight. Um, as I'm pulling up the slides, I just wanna again introduce myself. I'm Dr. Jamie Reif with the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, um, Director of Communications and Development. So for those of you that haven't heard about MDHI, I wanna share a little bit about us, as well as talk about the efforts from local planning on homelessness that will be kind of kicking off tomorrow. So what is MDHI for people who haven't heard of us? Um, we're the continuum of care in the region. Our mission is leading and advancing collaboration to end homelessness in our region. So basically what a continuum of care is, it's a regional system that coordinates services and housing for people experiencing homelessness. And then similarly to Dr. Cog, our region is the seven county Metro Denver region. Um, and some of the things that you might've heard about that we do is the annual point in time, which is the count that occurs normally in non-COVID times every January. Um, the homeless management information system was an information system that is used across not only our region, but our state. We're one of the few states in the entire country that has a uniform information system to be able to help track data for people experiencing homelessness and the services that they receive. We work on the One Home Coordinated Entry System, which is how we dynamically match people to housing resources in our region. Um, we recently authored the State of Homelessness Report, which is a global um, kind of snapshot of homelessness um, to better help inform everyone around what is happening in our region. And the other thing we do is bring a lot of funding into the region, both through federal and local funds. So let's talk about a little bit about the regional um, coordination that has um, kind of been years in the making, but is really kind of launching tomorrow. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what we're hoping to do, again, every community is different, as all of you know, and we are just really looking to help coordinate local planning at a regional level on the issue of homelessness, similarly to what you do in transportation. Um, we've also spent the last three years standing up our homeless management information system. 
um, and now have really great, robust, real-time data on who's experiencing homelessness. We have a working um, coordinated entry system, and there's been a lot of local planning and progress on the issue. So we want to kind of capitalize on that. The other thing that's happened is we've seen a lot of public and elected will to coordinate regionally on local solutions. Um, a lot of that you know, has been brought to light due to the inherent inequity during the COVID-19 pandemic of people that do not have a home. And there's also been a lot of expanded resources for individuals experiencing homelessness at the federal, state, and local levels. And so what we wanna do is kind of capitalize on that and make it um, as impactful as possible. So basically the rollout will kind of be in three phases on this regional coordination. Each phase will have a different set of stakeholders. Um, and we're gonna be talking about something called the Built for Zero framework. And I'll give you an overview of that really quickly here tonight. Um, phases occur that are going to occur at the overall regional level and at the local level, just to make sure we're meaningfully including the right individuals and communities in this work. And I will say all of our communities are already engaged in this work. Um, it's really a matter of working alongside and then making sure that all of those efforts are um, kind of maximized across the region. So starting tomorrow at 8.30 a.m., um, we are having a convening of elected officials to come together and really talk about what regional coordination looks like on the issue of homelessness. So you can see there that we have mayors, county commissioners, city council members, city managers, um, as well as state, um, a lot of our state electeds and even members of Congress are sending people to attend the event. Um, and really what we wanna talk about is the critical role that can be played at a regional level on this issue. Um, what we've been doing over the past three years to really get us to this point, and then what we can do and the action that can be taken by leaders to help clear the path in reductions um, that are all going to be grounded in work around equity. So tomorrow the event will be for, again, for the elected officials via Zoom and for everyone else, we're inviting you to attend via our MBHI Facebook page. It will be live streamed. So we'd love to see you there. Um, and kind of at the end, we're going to talk around um, asking for a pledge, just really around this idea of regional coordination uh, on reductions in homelessness. So talking about the Built for Zero framework, and I know I'm using a lot of terms here today, um, but really this is a movement of more than 80 communities that's been proving it's possible to measurably end homelessness one population at a time. And this is in partnership with a national nonprofit called Community Solutions. And they do this work across the United States and even internationally. And what they've been able to do is, um, again, you can kind of see the map there. There are 84 communities participating 14 communities have ended veteran or chronic homelessness. Over, at this point, about 130,000 people have been housed through these initiatives. 49 communities have made measurable reductions in homelessness. And then 83 communities have achieved quality real-time data, which is really the first step in making measurable reductions is knowing exactly who's experiencing homelessness, um, where they are, and how to get them to the right resources. So you can see here kind of a list of communities that have ended chronic or veteran homelessness through this Built for Zero work. So that's kind of phase one, that will kick off tomorrow. So phase two is really gonna be this local briefing and planning phase. So it's gonna be a convenings at the community levels for local planning. Um, these, we're gonna have stand up, and I have a visual here in a second, these community coordination teams, um, along with kind of these community briefing teams, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. And really the, the hope is that these two groups will work together to move communities towards progress on these built for zero benchmarks that if they're hit, can again measurably reduce homelessness and get a community to a place where they are housing people more quickly than people are flowing into homelessness. And that generally speaking, you can house someone experiencing homelessness within 30 days. So kind of what this looks like, again, we have, um, a lot of different communities. Right now, we're kind of, we've stood up a lot of the, the county levels. We're still kind of in talks with communities like Aurora as to how they're gonna fit into this work and what makes the most sense for them. And then each of these communities will have this kind of, this, this stood up. And when we were looking at how to really move this work forward and what works for a regional planning and how coordination can happen, one of the things that came very clear very quickly is that transportation has this kind of figured out. You coordinate very well around regionally around the issue of transportation. So what we really wanna do is mirror the existing framework from Dr. Cog on transportation to create a parallel framework for homelessness. So basically in each of the communities we'll have a homeless coordination team, which will be 
um, what's called a data lead, which is an MDHI staff member, a community lead, which is someone designated by the community. It could be a provider. It could be someone at the municipal level that whose role it is really to work on this issue, providers, housing authorities, and other members. And then what we plan to stand up, again, similarly to what you already have with Dr. Cog, so that it is a very familiar framework, um, our technical advisory committees specifically for homelessness. So again, it might be city managers, it might be appointees, it might be you know, other people that are really doing the work. Um, and then again, similarly to what you do at Dr. Cog with transportation is having sub-regional forums so that electeds kind of have a clear path and line of sight to progress that's being made in their communities around this work. And then phase three is really going to be outreaching to non-participating providers and partners. So we have a lot of people, providers, we have a lot of um, different organizations that already use HMIS, they're very engaged in this work. Um, but we have a lot of providers that might be smaller providers, they might be um, organizations that aren't necessarily required to use HMIS due to funding, or they might be providers that really serve a lot of our BIPOC communities that we have not done a good job of engaging with. And so what we plan to do this summer is really be very strategic and outreaching to those partners and bringing them to the table to include this in, to include them in, in the work. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much. Do any directors have any questions or comments they'd like to make at this time this evening? And if you could go ahead and raise your hand and we can participate that way. Or I can just start calling on people. <laughs> the first commenter is from our executive director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And Jamie, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just want to say that listen, this is a new partnership for us. Um, and the, the meetings that we have had, I've been so excited by the energy of M MDHI staff and their commitment to this very, very important regional issue. I know we, you know, city and county manager forums that we've had, um, this always rises to the very top as, as a critical issue for our, for our region. And we felt as a result that we should have some involvement in this. And so we're we're uh, committed to be a resource to Jamie and her staff as much as practical um, and help them in filling out and coordinating these sub-regional forums. Um, you know, I think, as we know, I think we've had, so there is some value to, to, our, to our model that we do use and, and we're hoping we can stand up a similar type of uh, framework for Jamie. Thank you so much, Executive Director Rex. Director Brockett. Yeah, I'll echo those words of Doug's. I represent the city of Boulder and you know, it's a very challenging issue um, in our community as it is for many other communities across the, the region and, and nationally. We do have a, a county consortium where we work with our partners at Boulder County and the city of Longmont and others. Uh, that's extremely helpful. We get a lot more done with that, but um, this really demands a, a regional response. Um, so I'm really glad you're doing it. I know there are representatives from my city that will be at that convening tomorrow. And so we, we stand ready to, to work with you um, as a city and through Dr. Cog uh, to do whatever we can to make progress on this extremely difficult issue. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brackett. Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, thank you. I'm hailing from Douglas County. Um, little known fact that we have a concern in Douglas County as well. And um, some people don't always uh, think of that first and foremost, maybe because it's rural or maybe other reasons, but I want to thank you and applaud you and the rest of Dr. Cog for taking this up. My question has to do with um, a, a unique segment of the homeless population, and that is the hidden ones. Mm -hmm. We have a um, certain number of um, young folks who are housing, home, home insecure, housing insecure, couch surfing and the like, and they're actually students in our school district. And those are the ones that I pay attention to on my focus, my personal focus. And I'm wondering if um, you can focus or give a little bit of focus on that. Yeah, you know, I really appreciate that. I'm the former state coordinator for homeless education and for the Department of Ed in Colorado and have done a lot of work. I was a former homeless education liaison. Um, so I genuinely appreciate you bringing that up. And I will say MBHI has been very focused, particularly since I've joined the staff on that population. And I will be speaking to it tomorrow when we talk about data, because if you want to know what's going on with family homelessness and hidden homelessness, where you need to look is the McKinney-Vento homeless education data in our school districts. 
So I genuinely appreciate your attention to that. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Does that, um, is that the end of your comments? Uh, yes, it is. I had already thank muted you. myself, but yes, thank, thank you. I'm really thank glad you. that that's you know, on your mind and that that's your experience too. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Olson. Ooh, quicker than I thought. <laughs> thank you, Jamie, for this. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Cog for being willing to jump in and be a part of this to really provide some a structural understanding of, of something that could be useful for this in the long run. So <clears throat> I really thank you, Doug, for doing that and, and your staff for providing that because we need this. We need this to really make a difference in the region. And uh, so I, I think Jamie, or maybe I should say Dr. Reif, <laughs> what, um, what would you say would be your best hope for tomorrow? If at the end of the day, I mean, many of us are going to attend. Um, what, what would be, you know, this was a success by the end of the day. Yeah, I you think, on the spot. <laughs> yeah, what a great question, though. Um, so I think, you know, what would be a win is for everyone to really rally around this idea and this framework. Um, again, this isn't supplanting what you're doing locally. This isn't coming in and, and you know, necessarily like showing you how to do things. It's working alongside and helping us get to data that can you can use in your communities to make meaningful change, make data, data driven decisions and really optimize your resources. And so if we can just get everyone doing that, what that does is that makes our region overall so much more effective and so much more efficient. And so I hope that's the takeaway that everyone has tomorrow is that if we work together and we're all getting to a place where we're understanding the issue of homelessness in our own communities and maximizing our own um, unique kind of responses that together we can make a, a real impact. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Director Olson. Director Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just want to echo previous comments. Doug, Dr. Cog, I'm very excited that, that you all are providing this resource for us. I think, you know, this is a kind of a regional issue that a lot of folks maybe don't see as necessarily regional. So I think Dr. Cog's the perfect place. Um, and, and Dr. Reif, I think uh, your comment about kind of that data-driven policymaking, I think that's that's spot on. I'm very excited. My own question, do you, are, are there any kind of shining star examples of regions that have effectively or are effectively uh, approaching uh, the issue of homelessness? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because I think different communities are at different places. Um, I'll tell you, and I, I will say I've only been at MDHI about a year. Um, and so, but before that I was, you know, in homeless education and kind of was on the, the other side, if you will. I will say in the last year, what I have seen is particularly like Jefferson County make some really concerted uh, investments, um, actually stood up staff members. They have created also kind of regional coordinators within the county that act as outreach staff and really points of contact so that it's all kind of flowing to one place. Um, and just having those resources available and then their community has made really great strides in getting their providers to be using the homeless management information system in a region that was a little bit resistant in the past or had been you know, historically a little bit resistant. And so I think what that has shown me is that change can happen very quickly um, and we can make progress quickly if there is community kind of buy-in and there is something that we're all kind of rallying around. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Director Williams. Director Coombs. Hi, and thank you for joining us and for always being willing to join any group, <laughs> big or small, to discuss the work that you all are doing. I'm very excited to uh, hear more tomorrow and for us to be able to have really good data and best practices to work together because this is very much an issue that needs to be addressed regionally and grateful for your efforts. That's it. Thank you, Director Coombs. Director Levy. Thank you. I, I raised my hand and then I lowered it and I decided to go ahead and raise it again and, and make, uh, and make a, a comment or a question uh, as well that um, uh, the, the population, I guess, that you're 
uh, targeting um, with with the work that you're trying to do. And uh, I think one thing that I've noticed over the years is that when people think about homelessness, it's it's usually the very visible homeless, and that's it's the you know the frequent utilizers that you know people feel are problematic. Um, and I understand why there's a lot of attention on on uh, unhoused people who you know are living on the streets, but there you know there is a significant population uh, which I think Director Mulvey was sort of getting at as well, who. Um, are are you know, have shelter of some sort, but they don't have a home. They may be doubling up, uh, couch surfing, sleeping in a car, and so I wonder if the the process that you're going through here um, would address people like that, who um, some of whom are homeless, some of whom are just in a very precarious situation and and could become unhoused at any moment. So how you know how would you how would your process address that population? Yeah, what a great question. Again, thank you for talking about the invisible homeless because that is a, we don't talk about that enough. Um, the process that we're using with Built for Zero, it does two things. So it addresses both getting people that are in shelter and in unsheltered situations into housing. The other thing that it does is it does prevention and creating um, ways to stop inflow. And that is a really important piece. So the people that, you know, the individuals that you're talking about that are in precarious situation may become what is referred to as literally homeless. We have a process for prevention to make sure that we're shutting off the valves into homelessness, as well as making sure we have outflow from homelessness. Thank you so much. Um, what a what a wonderful introduction to the topic for the board, and I think many of us are attending, uh, or someone from our community is attending tomorrow, and so that this is a great segue into that. And we'll give the last comment to Director Dale. Thanks, Dr. Wright, for your comments on this, and we at Jeffco are proud of the starting efforts we're making for coordinating and uh, cities putting people putting staff towards these and we are very positive about that because there's we've got homeless and unhoused and we have affordable living issues that are big deals throughout uh, particularly in this COVID time and even before so thanks for giving us some kudos but I think we'll continue to learn and unfortunately I won't be able to be there tomorrow but I will know what my colleagues will be thank you thank you Thank you so much, everyone. Great conversation. And so that will um, end that strategic informational briefing this evening and take us to our next agenda item, which is the report of the chair. I'll just start by saying I've been invited to one meeting um, as the Dr. Cog chair to discuss a potential transportation funding bill. And you'll hear more about that in the legislative update. And then I'd just like to take a moment um, to recognize the Dr. Cog staff um, they've been working tirelessly for the last year, pretty well remotely. Um, the area agency and aging staff have done a lot of in-person work, as have others, um, giving direct services to our senior citizens, meals, rides, ombudsmen and services. Um, the, the planning staff also have been working tirelessly the last year in, you know, who knows how many Zoom meetings, um, doing lobbying for us, planning for us, doing census work for us, uh, trying to make sure we get all the transportation funding we possibly can for our region. And just on behalf of the entire Dr. Cog board, wanna thank all of the staff members for just a year of incredible service um, that really words can't describe how much, um, how grateful we are and how thankful we are for everything you've put in. And with that, I will turn it to a report on the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, the Performance and Engagement Committee met on Wednesday, March 3rd. Following the board workshop, we discussed two topics. Uh, one was an uh, in-town board workshop for late summer. Normally we've done that as a get out of town type thing, but obviously with the pandemic, that's much, uh, much more challenging. Executive Director Rex led a conversation regarding potential topics, timing, and a lot more information, a lot more conversation is to come on that one. Also, we discussed the virtual Dr. Cog Award celebration scheduled for Wednesday, April 28th. Amber Lieberman did a wonderful job presenting and talking us through that. Uh, Amber, feel free to correct me if I misspeak on uh, the topic at all. Uh, we agreed the award celebration would be best held during the day. So it's now scheduled for 11.30 a.m. Uh, it is virtual. 
and individual registration is complimentary. Again, much more uh, in the way of details to come on that. On behalf of the Performance and Engagement Committee, we hope you can participate in the award celebration. It's always a great event, and this darn pandemic just kind of delayed our uh, ability to recognize some outstanding people and projects. That's my report. Thank you so much, Director Conklin. That takes us to report on the Finance and Budget Committee. The Finance and Bu Budget Committee did not meet, so there is no report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And that takes us to our next agenda item this evening, which is a report of our Executive Director. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, thank you very kindly for, for your remarks um, about staff. And I, I think it goes without saying how I feel about them and the tremendous work they've done. The, the productivity level has not dipped at all during COVID. Um, but it's, you know, listen, hey, we're all looking forward to getting together again and, and uh, being, in, being in the same place. So let's cross our fingers that we're headed in the right direction. So thank you very much. Um, vaccination event. I, uh, first, I, I mean, you mentioned the AAA staff and all the work that they've been doing. Um, we partnered once again with SEL Health and our transportation providers um, to, pro to provide rides for older adults um, to a mass vaccination event on, on uh, Saturday, March 6th. That's the second SCL event that we participated in. And I think we learned a lot from the last time and uh, the, eighth, the first event went fine, but this one went really smoothly and we were, we were appreciative and a big thanks and shout out to Jail and her staff with regards to that. Um, Director Conklin mentioned the award celebration and everything he said in his report was indeed correct. Um, but in but we are it's under the umbrella of um, under the theme of reunion this year is what we're going with. Um, and we will be honoring the winners of the uh, Metrovision Distinguished Service Awards and the John V. Christensen Award, which is our biggest um, individual award. Celebration um, is during the day. It's going to be an hour long event. Again, we hope that's what we're striving for right now. An hour long event starting at 1130 on Wednesday, April 28th. Um, we're thrilled we have like 16 board members and alternates that are already signed up. Um, so please watch your email for, for invitations. We'll be sending them out periodically and make sure we get as many signed up as we can. It's, it's, uh, but if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to myself or Amber Lieberman or Steve Erickson or anybody, uh, Director Conklin, um, if you have any questions about the event and we'll make sure you get the answers. Also wanted to give you guys just a, a quick reminder that we are doing an affordable housing uh, webinar series. Um, we had great turnouts for our first event and our April affordable, affordable housing workshop will focus on learning from developers of affordable housing and what local governments can do to kind of, you know, make it easier in the process for, for those folks. And, and so I think that it's kind of a lessons learned from their perspective, which is one maybe we don't listen to uh, enough sometimes. Um, and they will provide uh, some insight into how to deal with, uh, with zoning, parking requirements, building codes, utility costs, all that kind of good stuff. Registration will open in early April and the event is scheduled to be held um, on April 22nd, which is Earth Day from uh, 10 till noon. So, um, so please be on the lookout for, for that email when we send it your way. Um, I did want to give you guys an update on the uh, land use um, land cover regional data acquisition project that Dr. Cog has undertaken. And last week we uh, received a um, Colorado Water Conservation Board approved a hundred thousand dollar grant that will be that will invest state dollars to match the local funds committed by Mile High Flood District, um, City of Boulder, Broomfield, Castle Rock, Erie, Inwood Village, and Wheat Ridge to acquire detailed land cover data uh, for our region. Um, it's, it's, it's great news for all of us, everybody involved in this project. And I really truly wanna say how instrumental the flood district uh, was in making that happen, including working closely with us um, to identify the partners and to scope the project and as presented in the uh, successful grant application. So please, I know there are uh, several of you that are serving on that board, please share our gratitude with, uh, with staff over there. Um, and we'll begin the project as soon as possible with the goal of uh, to produce a deliverable by the end of this year. So stay tuned. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. That takes us to our public comment period for this evening. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I would request that no public comment be made on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Um, 
consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. If there are any members of the public that would care to address us at this time, please raise your hand using the participant panel. Or if you've dialed in by phone, you can dial star nine and we will see a hand raised on your behalf. Seeing none, that takes us to the consent agenda. Could I please get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Bill Gipp, Director Gipp. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, sir. Director Teal. Second. Thank you, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Thank you, everyone. The consent agenda is approved. That takes us to our first action item this evening, which is discussion on the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Program, or also known as Safer Main Streets. The project awards round 1.5. Ron uh, Papsdorf, our Director of Transportation Planning and Operations is going to take us through this agenda item. And if you're following along in your packet, it's attachment E. Ron? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let's see, should be just pulling up my presentation. Uh, thank you, I'm Ron Papsdorf. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Happy to be here with the board this evening. Appreciate this opportunity. Um, before I really launch into this, I do just want to take a moment and, and really express um, the Dr. Cog staff thanks to CDOT. Um, this, this partnership has been difficult at times. I think Rebecca White and I would probably both admit that, but it's been I think we're really happy with where we've ended up uh, and really happy to bring this, um, this recommendation to you uh, this evening. It, uh, I am confident that the investment of these resources through the board's previous action um, and your consideration of this recommendation this evening is gonna make a real difference for people in this region uh, in terms of uh, multimodal um, safety and multimodal improvements around the region. So with that, just give you a quick little bit of background as a reminder, or for new members of the board, um, the Safer Main Streets program is a joint venture between CDOT and Dr. Cog. Uh, we identified a combined total of $77 million available for projects, uh, really focused on reducing uh, fatal and serious injury crashes around the region and uh, better and more safely to accommodate um, all modes of, of transportation around the region, uh, improving transit access and multimodal mobility, uh, supporting development of our urban centers and multimodal quarters around the region and providing um, good access um, for everyone in the region to help communities um, adjust to new travel patterns um, caused by COVID-19. Uh, the project, the original project solicitation period opened on July 9th of last year and closed on August 14th. We received 46 applications requesting $123 million uh, through a joint review panel process uh, between Dr. Cog and CDOT. Um, the Dr. Cog board awarded $58.9 million for full or partial funding to 30 projects across 18 jurisdictions. And I apologize, there was an, there was an error in the staff report, in the original staff report that said nine jurisdictions. It actually was 18 jurisdictions across the region. Um, CDOT and Dr. Cog, as part of that um, action, agreed to a phase, what we call 1.5, to work with those partially, partially successful and unsuccessful applicants uh, to try to identify ways to allocate uh, the remaining funds in the program. This is just a list of those um, projects that were awarded funds in the, in the first round of review and approvals. The full list of all the projects that were applied for and the funding is also an attachment in the staff report uh, for your reference. Um, with that, I uh, invite Rebecca White from CDOT to jump in and talk about the process uh, and our recommendation that's coming forward tonight. Thank you, Ron. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, good evening, everyone. Rebecca White with the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, I'll just start out here by echoing uh, Ron's comments on, on the partnership. It has been a, a bumpy road at times, but um, I think a, a, a very good outcome in the end. And I'm just so excited to see these projects uh, get delivered and really um, make a difference in the disturbing uh, rates we're seeing on pedestrian and bicycle injuries and fatalities. So I'll pick it up here with what we have been calling phase 1.5 of this process. 
uh, it, it started with a letter to every project sponsor that had either received a partial award or um, for an initial no from the first round. And the second bullet I think was a really important step in this process, um, which was these uh, feedback discussions we had. We offered a one-on-one -on -one session with every community. Those included a, a team of, of staff from CDOT and Dr. Cog. And we had um, almost everyone take us up on that. And I do want to thank the communities for the time they spent with that. That was really valuable to better understanding these projects. Uh, the next step was uh, sort of a short form to just elicit some additional information. We took that all back um, to our CDOT Dr. Cog group. And you'll see on, on the next slide the, the results of that review. Um, in terms of the projects that we've suggested um, move forward. So there were um, eight communities altogether that asked for um, either full funding of a project that was partially funded or um, simply just funding for a project initially declined. And then the next slide shows you the results there. So uh, Ron had left you with um, about 18 million in uh, remaining dollars after phase one. You see here that um, we're recommending that 16.8 of that be allocated to the, to the projects above. Um, I'm sure that the board will notice we still have an unallocated balance there of about 1.3 million. However, um, in a sort of wonderful coincidence, the state legislature recently provided 30 million to CDOT um, to expand this program statewide, along with kind of a, a sister program called Revitalizing Main Streets. So what we would propose doing with that remaining dollars is to go ahead and roll it into the new program. But of course, we would um, uh, set aside or sort of earmark those dollars so that they go to the Dr. Cog area. So with that, I, I believe I hand the baton um, back to Ron for the, the next steps here. But thank you again for the, the time tonight and all the board's involvement in this process over the last few months. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. We do have, um, so we do have for the board's consideration um, a recommended motion to award the $16.8 million to the seven projects as presented and uh, giving Dr. Cox staff the authority to in, in, administratively modify the TIP to include these projects. Um, into the transportation improvement program. So with that, happy to take any questions from, from the board. Thank you very much, uh, Director Papsdorf and Director White. Well, that'll take us to comments. We have a few in the queue so far. Others are also welcome to raise their hands and join in. And the first question, comment, um, or motion is from Director Sandgren. Thank you, Director Stoltzman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. I, I just really want to say thank you for presenting this information, Rebecca. I think it's great to hear that we're actually going to put more funding into this program. Um, I think this is really important as we do talk about all aspects of mobility and of course safety. So I appreciate the presentation tonight and look forward to supporting this. Thank you, Director Sandra. Director Shaw. Uh, thanks. And I do want to say that I do appreciate, you know, everything that's gone into this so far. And just so everyone knows, I'm from the Town of Superior, and I've been a Dr. Cog for all about two months. Um, looking back a page, you know, Town of Superior is the only one that didn't get funded in around 1.5. And I'm trying to get my head around the process a little bit more. Um, in some of the pages, it, it, it suggests that uh, CDOT and Dr. Cog reached out to the town. My town staff is a little confused because there really wasn't much of a conversation. So it's a question ultimately on the scoring that was used for 1.5. Is this the same scoring? Did we just sort of you know, bring the projects that were declined in, in round 1.0 and use the same scoring for round 1.5? And then finally, you know, there's the RTD 8, uh, ADA ramp project. There's no score on that. So at the end of the day, I'm trying to just kind of wrap my head around the allocation process here um, so I can tell my constituents kind of you know, why we didn't meet the, the cutoff this time around. And, and especially when you, when you look at the cutoff, there's 1.3 million remaining, and there's really, you know, the Town of Superior project is the only one that got uh, zeroed out. Thank you. Director White? Yeah, thank you, Director Shaw. Uh, good questions. And I'll say, as I um, start out here tonight, that I'd be more than happy to meet with you or any of the city staff to go to go for, go for through your project more fully. Um, they, the scoring was the same on, on 1.5. What we were able to do is just sort of better elicit more information, sit down with the cities, 
our, our counties and, and better understand any context we've missed, any additional safety data that was not presented the, the first time around. Um, you know, with this particular project, I know it well, because um, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time with these as well. Um, we looked at this sort of backwards and forwards and just really couldn't find that direct safety nexus for the Superior Project. Um, as I remember it, it's a, a roundabout that I, it would uh, help quite a bit with kind of ingress and egress out of a, a development area, but uh, there was no history of accidents. Um, so again, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to, to sit down with you and go through that more. Like I said, I, we've got about 10 folks who I think know that project well. Um, I'll also say on the RTD projects, because those are, um, I think probably about three dozen ADA ramps, it really wasn't possible to score those. However, what we did receive from RTD in kind of the second round was a list of locations, which was missing um, at, the, at the first go, it was just sort of a, a blanket request. And so knowing exactly where those were provided the additional level of detail the committee was looking for. Uh, Ron, would you add anything there? No, I think, I think that's exactly right, Rebecca. And I would, I would just echo what you said. Um, and uh, Dr. Cox staff worked really closely with CDOT and looking at all of these. And um, we, this is a consensus recommendation. I will, I will note that this has a unanimous recommendation from the Transportation Advisory Committee, as well as the Regional Transportation Committee coming to the board this evening. Director Shaw, I'm sorry if it was my end or your end, but I just, I didn't hear what your comment was there. And if you have another comment. No, I, I guess, you know, you know, that the comment there, there isn't a history of accident to me is I think the one that threw me off. I mean, there have been four accidents, you know, there haven't been any fatalities, thank God. Um, I think it's just a question of ultimately, you know, you know, if there is an accident, how many, what's the threshold for, you know, calling something accident prone? I think the issue we have within the town of Superior, everyone knows, of course, Classic and McCaslin continues to be a magnet for just, you know, competitive cycling. And that intersection is one that terrifies me as the volume continues to grow and more people continue to use the, the course classic ramp. But um, I do understand the, the criteria that was used and it, you guys are trying to be as objective as possible. Um, Director White, just one follow up. Will, um, would Superior be eligible to resubmit this project for the new round of funding and have staff work with CDOT staff to understand if it's eligible and meets the criteria? Excellent idea, um, idea Madam Chair. That um, because we have this uh, launch of this relaunch of the of this new program, I think that is another opportunity and happy to spend as much time as you'd like, Director Shaw, talking through how we how we could better understand the merits of this project. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dyack. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It, again, this uh, the Safer Main Streets program um, happened under my, my chairmanship and uh, I was fantastically excited uh, that uh, CDOT and Dr. Cog could both partner together on, on this initiative. Um, as Mr. Papstorf and Director White did indicate, um, and, and as Director Shaw's comments allude to, that there were some bumps in, in the process, if you will. Um, thankful to Executive Director uh, Liu for uh, working through that with myself and the staff um, with, uh, with $18.1 million uh, still left on the table after the first round. Um, I felt um, compelled to see if there was any way that we could sort of figure out how we can get the original applicants um, a second look, if you will, because um, with, with all of these submittals and the, the quite honestly, the lack of funding that we have here to, in, in, in transportation land, um, it's, it's just very challenging to, uh, to see $18.1 million uh, out there when, when we could put it to roads to, to improve and to make our roads safe. Um, so to me, very thankful for, uh, for getting uh, getting to where we have with um, you know, um, round for phase 1.5. Uh, would like to spend all of it, but um, again, um, I think we have additional monies coming from the state legislature. Thank you very much. And uh, look forward to seeing what other projects uh, get submitted and get funded. I, I hope everyone, including Superior, um, really looks at these, these programs and applies. If, if, if you don't do it, um, you, you cannot, uh, can't win if you don't submit. So, um, you know, to me, I would just um, recommend that uh, everyone uh, work with staff and uh, become aware of these, 
these set-asides or these programs out there and really work with your staff to see if your municipality can, can truly benefit from one of these. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Dyack. Director Mauer. It, um, uh, um, um, hi. <laughs> um, good to see you, Director White. Um, and I just want to let you know that I'm uh, very appreciative of this program. And uh, we were able to, in Centennial, able to take a, advantage of a couple spots that needed some, really needed some safety improvements. So that was very helpful. My question is, um, for the new round of funding, do you have a schedule or dates or anything, what we're looking at? I, I do, um, and Dr. Maurer, uh, it's, it's always good to see you too. And in fact, I was, I was looking at this list, um, City of Centennial with a hawk signal brings, brings me back to our <laughs> early days working together on a hawk signal in Denver. Um, so the, the legislature approved uh, this 30 million uh, about a week and a half ago. We expect the governor to sign the bill as early as this week. And um, we're prepared to open that process almost immediately. So I think it will, it will happen very soon. Um, we briefed our transportation commission on this program today, are seeking their support tomorrow. And then, like I said, I expect the governor to, to sign this by the end of the week. Great, thank you. Thank you, Director Mauer. Director Gip. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna follow up on uh, former Chair Dyack's comments. Um, I, I definitely know that it's up to us at some point to follow up with our staffs and make sure that they're aware of all the things that are popping up all the time. And so that's something that I've tried to make sure I maintain with all the emails flowing around, uh, trying to direct some of those. Um, and there's, there's absolutely times when there's these programs that pop up and I forward it to you know, Parks and Rec or Public Works, and they say, oh my gosh, we had not heard of that. So I would just, uh, yeah, uh, say, please definitely make sure that all of your staffs are aware of these two and, and coordinate with them because there are a lot of opportunities. And Erie was one of the smaller ones that was lucky enough to uh, be included in that first round. So I believe there is equity in the program. And I, and I think if you get involved, that it would be uh, very advantageous. So thank you. Thank you, Director Gipp. Would you like to make a motion um, on that positive note? <laughs> I will motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Mayor Starker, I'll second that. Thank you, Director Starker. And Director Mauer, did you have another comment? No, I was just going to second it. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Director Mauer. All right. Are there any other comments or discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Those opposed? Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. That takes us to discussion on state legislative issues, new bills for consideration and action. And I'll just give a little brief introduction before, before I turn it over to Rich Marr, our senior policy and legislative analyst. So you'll all want to open the packet to attachment F. And this part of the year, if, if you're new to Dr. Cog, kind of moves quickly and you sort of say, ah, where did all of this information come from? But what will happen is that Rich and, and our uh, lobbyists will take us through all the different bills that are popping up on transportation and senior issues as identified in our policy that we approved last month. So we have our state legislative policy and they're gonna be monitoring for things that they need our opinion on. And so um, typically month, month for the next couple of months, we'll just be talking about modifications and we'll talk about each one individually. But because today is the first shot at this, we're going to actually go through all the bills and ask for us to take a position on all of them at one time at the end. And so as we go through them, if there are any bills that you flag that you wanna pull out for, for separate discussion, just flag that and save it for the end and we can pull them out and we'll just take up as many as we can in a group at one time and then just have the discussion on those other items. And it can be hard um, for members at times if their council hasn't weighed in on one of these things, like let's say it just came up this morning and we're hearing about it tonight, your council may not have weighed in. So just think back to your council's policy statements and if you can um, find a, a way to take a position within your council's policy, that's usually a, a good path forward. Another thing many members do is just 
put their Dr. Cog hat on and think, well, as the Dr. Cog region, what is the best position I can take as a Dr. Cog director this evening? And if you can't take a position, you can always abstain. And so with that brief introduction, I'd just like to turn it over to Rich Morrow for our presentation. All right, thank you, Madam Chairman. Appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm gonna actually first ask um, one of our lobbyists, Ed Bowditch, to give a, a quick brief uh, update on the status of the state budget. And then I will go through the bills. And then after that, I'm gonna ask our other uh, lobbyist, Jennifer Castle, to mm -hmm. give a brief update on uh, transportation funding status. So uh, Ed, are you ready? Thank you, Rich. Uh, good evening, members. Um, I'll start by saying that this coming Friday is the most important day of the year. <laughs> Friday is the March quarterly revenue estimates. And anyone who has any stake in the budget, whether you're K-12 education, state funding for senior services, or anything else, this is the most important day of the year. So while the JBC has been hard at work since November, working up to developing the budget for next year, um, everything is on the line for Friday. The December revenue estimates were quite positive, um, but we'll wait to see what happens on Friday. For us representing Dr. Cog, it really is a lot of our focus is on the state funding for senior services line item. We have worked over the last 10 years or so to really strengthen the state investment, the state general fund appropriations for the state funding for senior services line item. 10 years ago, that line item had less than a million dollars. In fiscal year 1920, the last full fiscal year, that line had $14.8 million. We have been very proud. It has certainly been a team effort with a lot of hard work to get the legislature to boost funding for the senior services line item. Now, I know there are some who say that's not anywhere where it needs to be to address all of the seniors on the waiting lists. And we get that, but we have uh, been proud of the progress we've made and there's a lot more work to do. Um, with the budget cutting last spring in the pandemic, the legislature reduced our funding, um, general fund by $3 million. We went from 14.8 down to 11.8. The governor's budget request this year wanted to bring us back down to a further 7.3. In effect, cutting our funding in half, our state funding in half. The governor's office didn't want to cut the funding. They were using all these cash funds to prop us up. But a dollar is not equal to a dollar. And I'd rather have a dollar of general fund any day than a dollar of one-time cash funds. General fund indicates an ongoing significant state investment. Cash funds can come and go. Um, so we wanted to get our general fund back. That was our first priority. Bring us back to the $14.8 million level. After working with the JBC staff and all the JBC members, the initial figure setting was completed and we got almost all the way back. We're back at 14.5 million. So we were thrilled to get our general fund back and that there was such strong support among the JBC. Again, don't want anyone to think that we're satisfied with that. There's still a long way to go in future years, but we hope there are no changes to that line item in the final budget balancing. The other issue we had is there had been some spillover funds that had been available. Some of those were used in budget balancing, but there was still $7 million left and we did not want that money to disappear in some sort of a budget switch. And the legislature, the Joint Budget Committee did not take that money. So they're letting us use that money, spend it down for senior services. And we were very happy on both of those fronts. So really that's what I have to report tonight from the budget. Um, again, where the JBC is trying to wait for Friday, they're trying to see what the governor's gonna do with the, some of the federal stimulus funds um, and then the governor and the legislative leadership have also announced certain state stimulus funds. You may have seen the press conference a week ago. But with that, um, unless there are questions, I will turn it back to Rich. Okay, thank, thank you, Ed. So Do you see any questions? Nope, I was just saying okay. thank you. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and let me, let me clarify two things on that real quick. The, the numbers that Ed are referring to are actually uh, statewide totals for all of the 16 area agencies around the state. 
Um, and Dr. Cog generally receives somewhere in the vicinity of 40% of the total funding. Um, but because of the resources and staff that we have, we're, we're usually the ones that are down there at the Capitol uh, advocating uh, on behalf of the other AAAs. Uh, and the other thing I think is worth highlighting is um, the, the, the long bill always reflects really as an informational item, the amount of funding that the state is receiving from the Federal Older Americans Act. And uh, because of uh, a lot of hard work that uh, Jayla and uh, others, um, Doug and, and Jennifer Schaffel before that, and Mickey, our federal lobbyists had done over the years in um, changing uh, the formula on how the Older Americans Act is distributed. That was, we were actually successful in getting some changes last year. Actually, during the pandemic, the Congress reauthorized the Older Americans Act. And um, because of that, uh, the state of Colorado was due to receive over a $3 million increase in federal funding in the Older Americans Act. And that was also one of the uh, amounts of funding that um, the original governor's budget was uh, offsetting to create some general fund savings. Um, but um, with the JBC, uh, actually the, the depart department decided to back off on that when they resubmitted uh, some of their budget items uh, after the first of the year. Uh, so we are actually going to receive that as, a, as an overall increase for the state. So we were glad to see that. So with those two updates, um, I will go through uh, and highlight uh, quickly, uh, briefly identify the bills on this list. And let me know, note for particularly for, for uh, new members of the board, um, if you're looking at uh, this matrix, um, you know, we try to do brief identification of the bill, brief summary. Um, we list a staff recommended position uh, we always tie it to a uh, adopted board legislative policy, which is listed in the last column, and then uh, usually have some uh, additional staff comments in terms of uh, explaining more about the bill or why the staff is making that recommendation. Uh, the narrow column that's uh, identified as FN, that's a link if it's available for the fiscal note of the bill. And um, if it's blank, that just means that there was no fiscal, fiscal note available at the time this went out. Uh, so with that, um, and I appreciate Lisa um, keeping up with me. She's in charge of the screen here as I go through these. So with uh, Senate Bill 128, um, the, on the nursing home penalty cash fund changes, um, this is, this is uh, in general related to uh, Dr. Cogs, or, or our, we look at this as related to our role as a, a long-term care ombudsman with that program. And um, basically, so we take an interest. It doesn't directly affect what we do, but we certainly have an interest in, in how this program works. Uh, the, the money is supposed to go for, uh, to help fund efforts to improve quality of care uh, in uh, nursing facilities. And uh, this bill basically, for the most part, is transferring responsibility for that fund and that program from HICPUF to CDPHE. And there's a few other changes uh, that it makes, but that, that's really the gist of it. Um, we, at this point, um, are just asking to, to, mon to be able to monitor bit the bill to see if anything real significant one way or another crops up. So move on to the next one, Senate Bill 158. Uh, this is actually uh, basically the same as a bill that uh, was introduced last year and had to be set aside when the legislature shut down. Um, it was the bill that uh, uh, Dr. Cog supported last year, I believe actually, I think I tied, tied uh, or figured out it was uh, House Bill 1315, um, but uh, um, would like to be able to support this bill again this year. Uh, it's an effort to provide an incentive to, that would increase 
um, healthcare providers with uh, geriatric specialty. And um, so we would uh, ask for a support position on that bill. And then the next one, I go to Senate Bill 11 or House Bill 1172. And uh, that bill um, is uh, actually, we, at one point we were interested in, in supporting this bill as a way to, to be able to get family members in to facilities to see their uh, loved ones, the residents of the facilities. Um, but uh, I, you know, I wanna just monitor it at this point. I, I think there's, there's gonna be uh, some questions from the industry and from the state which you know has its own uh, responsibilities, you know, related to the pandemic and being able to open up. And there's already some uh, moves in this direction already. So this bill ultimately may not be necessary, uh, but we want to be able to keep to, to follow that bill. And then the next one under aging is uh, House Bill 1187. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, and this one is another one that that um, relates actually to the uh, uh, case management programs or in the uh, Medicaid program. And so Dr. Cog doesn't specifically directly do that, but our, our aging folks in our in our uh, information and assistance world and our ADRC and so forth, our, um, they work in this case management world a lot. And so they're very interested in keeping up with what happens with this bill. It, it essentially is gonna set up a process with HICPUF to work with stakeholders uh, over the course of the next few years to redesign uh, the way case management is uh, operated and funded in the state and with a particular eye toward uh, uh, eliminating what they refer to as, uh, or, or to pre really to emphasize what they refer to as conflict-free case management. So we'd like to monitor that bill for now. And then we can move on to the transportation bills um, with House Bill 1076. And this bill again is, is also related. Oh, I got my numbers mixed up on, uh, I think I was thinking of this bill when I mentioned um, Senate Bill 158 from what, uh, so anyway, I'm sorry about that. Uh, this bill was also a bill from last year and this one was 1315. And it basically ref refers to uh, some light regulation of, uh, uh, apps that have cropped up for users along I-70, uh, particularly like uh, getting up to ski areas on the weekends and that sort of thing. I think this bill is actually being sponsored or is really generated out of the I-70 coalition and 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 the group up uh, West I-70 uh, that folks can uh, uh, access through these apps even like on the day of like a Saturday morning and and find a carpool uh, to get up the mountain. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's been some concerns from uh, the Ubers and Lyfts and so forth about cutting into their market, wanting some uh, regulation of these, uh, but there's an interest uh, in among the communities up the corridor to uh, provide um, some parameters for these uh, apps to be able to operate. We were going to support the bill last year before it also got pulled and have been asked actually by the coalition to, if we could support it again this year. Oh, also note, it's not mentioned here because I didn't find out till after this went out. Uh, I like to uh, highlight when I can on bills um, if uh, our partner organizations, uh, CML, CCI, and CCAT have taken positions on any of these bills. And I did note uh, subsequently that CCAT has a position uh, supporting this bill. The next one, uh, 1186, is uh, essentially the, the bill to implement the initial recommendations of the uh, RTD Accountability Committee that Dr. Cog has been helping to administer. And so I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this. And um, uh, so we would ask for a position of support on that bill. 
Next one, we go to 1196. And this is one that I could, it could take days to explain this. <laughs> um, it basically relates to um, over the last several years, different bills that have been introduced related to relating back to the uh, um, certificates of participation, I believe, and, and uh, um, that were uh, um, the lease purchase agreements and so forth that were authorized in uh, Senate Bill 267 way back in 2017 uh, to provide, I think it was close to $2 billion in through bonding for, for transportation. Um, over uh, subsequent years, that had all those provisions had gotten amended, depending on um, whether or not there were ballot measures that were passed or not passed in subsequent years. And legislature kept passing bills in in subsequent years. I believe they uh, uh, there was uh, um, Senate Bill One in in. Uh, 2000 or in 2018 and that uh, delayed the uh, ballot measure uh, that was in 267 to November 2019 and then Senate Bill 19263 delayed that ballot measure to November 2020 and then uh, last session though uh, there were two bills that made some changes to that process um, uh, ultimately delaying that ballot measure again to November 2021, but subsequently, I guess staff, uh, I think it was the statutory review committee, found um, some technical mistakes with all those changes last session, where essentially um, the, uh, um, the, the first bill that passed in 260 in uh, 2019 263 did not um, had a, referenced the November 2020 uh, election date and the uh, House Bill 1376 that came afterward um, moved the election date to November 21. So they have to go back in this bill and correct that. Um, so that's really all that does, but it does make the point that um, there still is a, uh, uh, a potential ballot measure uh, for the November 2021 um, ballot on the books right now. So that's what I, when I think that still took too long to explain, but it was then it could have been. <laughs> Let's see, then the next one is uh, last uh, transportation bill is House Bill 1205, um, um, this one um, put it on the list to monitor um, as uh, uh, something that, you know, obviously it's a it's, uh, similar topic to what we'll be talking about later and what's been talked about on transportation funding for this year with uh, electric vehicle road user fees. Um, obviously there's a whole lot more discussions going on um, in this situation than to uh, uh, you know, be really in a position to support or oppose a bill like this. So we really just, I think, need to monitor at this point uh, to see how or if it fits in with uh, the rest of the transportation funding discussion. All right, and then uh, we'll finish with three uh, housing related bills. Um, some of you will re recall that uh, in recent years, uh, we have seen quite a few bills uh, uh, attempting to address various aspects of uh, affordable housing issues, both in terms of trying to increase the supply of affordable housing, but also to uh, address landlord-tenant rela uh, uh, relationships. And um, particularly, uh, we take a lot of interest in them, both from the regional planning perspective, but also the aging services perspective in um, wanting uh, generally to support, as you'll see here, we're recommending support for all three bills, uh, bills that, uh, that we think can help keep uh, particularly older adults, but all renters really um, housed uh, in, in their communities. So the first one, um, 1117, 
is, is uh, uh, I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with this now. It, it uh, relates to clarifying that Telluride decision um, on, on rent control. And this bill clarifies that uh, uh, local government uh, working with the developer to uh, produce options for providing affordable housing uh, does not constitute um, rent control. And uh, notice that actually all three of our partner agencies, CML initiated the bill, but CCI and CCAT are also supporting it. Uh, the next one is 1121. And this one primarily focuses on um, uh, changes to the uh, fiction, eviction process, uh, the court procedures and the procedures and notice and things like that, that uh, landlords must give uh, the response times that tenants have and um, how those get presented in court and then timing in terms of the eviction depending on the uh, uh, court decision. Uh, so they make uh, no, a number of changes in that process. And, uh, and I think most of them are, are directed toward providing more transparency for the tenant and um, more time to come up with uh, the rent uh, in order that's, that's due in order to avoid eviction. The uh, next one is, uh, or last one actually, is uh, Senate Bill 173. And this one focuses much more on uh, fees and, and late fees that um, can be charged in various circumstances. And similarly, it, uh, uh, it uh, restricts the amounts of some of those fees and the circumstances under which they can be charged um, and also requires um, maybe a little more than what's in current law in terms of uh, notice and transparency about what those fees are and when they can be charged. And so with that, Madam Chair, I think those are all the bills. And what we were gonna do is obviously if, if anyone wants to pull a bill out and just talk about it or take a position on it separately, uh, but otherwise, if there's no objection to staff recommendations, we can entertain a motion on uh, all of the bills at once. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Morrow. And um, with that, I see one hand up at this time, or a few hands up at this time. And so we'll go to a member of questions and, and comments. And I will encourage us to try to keep as many bills on the list as possible for one vote, but we absolutely can take them off and vote on them each individually. So um, we'll take questions and then any suggestions for uh, bills that we need to remove from the list. And first up is Director Brackett. Yeah, Rich, thanks for that um, great explanation of the bills as always. Um, I just wanted to uh, have a further discussion about uh, HB 1205 about the electro vehicle fee. Mm -hmm. Should I speak to that now or, or should I just note that and we'll get, get back to it? Um, so I'll make note of the ones we want to talk about and then we'll try to go through them and see if we can keep them on for the vote. Um, but so I'll just make note of all the ones we'll go through and have a discussion about. Very good, thanks. Thank you very much. Director Sandgren. Thank you. I actually just have a question really quick about the, um, the couple of the transportation bills. Let me go back up here. Um, it's the two uh, HB 1186 and HB 1076. Um, I, I just don't see anything in there about committing to improvements and expansions of the multimodal network and mobility network. Is that a, like an understood part of that or, and, and also with tomorrow's unveiling of um, the winter and gray bill, I wonder if that will have any impact on this. Well, if I'm if I if I may, I I I guess I assume tomorrow's announcements will, um, and I I would defer to others uh, who've been more involved in the uh, RTD Accountability Committee maybe to answer your question on eleven eighty six, um, and then let's see what was the other bill. So, Rich, let's just start there with eleven eighty six. So, okay. Executive Director Rex, would you like to take that one, or would you like to give it to someone else? Yeah, I'll, uh, I know Ron has been eating and sleeping this. So Ron, uh, you want to mention this? 
this bill or provide some detail? Yeah, sure. Um, again, Ron Papstorff, Transportation Planning and Operations Director at Dr. Cog. Um, so uh, one of the one of the early act earlier actions from the um, RTD Accountability Committee uh, was to sort of look at uh, statute language uh, related to RTD's operations and develop some recommendations to forward to the legislature and the governor and to RTD that uh, the Accountability Committee felt would remove sort of unnecessary restrictions on RTD and um, make some things easier for RTD to kind of operate. Um, no one is under any illusion that, you know, none of these are silver bullets um, to address all of the issues associated with RTD or fix their current financial challenges or anything like that. But um, I think the accountability committee's recommendation, the accountability committee felt like they helped address some things that might might make things easier for RTD. So there are issues related to sort of easing some of the uh, easing some of the restrictions or making it easier for RTD to pursue um, development partnerships on property they own at their at their um, stations at their station areas. Um, uh, changes to statute associated with um, how. Um, how, how fair recovery ratio uh, is right now in statute sort of there's a there's a fair recovery statute um, uh, requirement uh, that could limit RTD's ability to explore things or, or pilot things like uh, significantly reduced fare structures or past programs that might reduce their fare revenue, but might actually increase ridership or be really important to helping RTD provide more equitable service um, around uh, its service territory. So uh, those are those are some of the changes that are included in the recommendation. Okay, that helps. Thanks, Ron. And then back over to Rich. I think there were some other questions there too. For 1076, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So that that bill does not specifically directly relate to. I think you mentioned uh, increasing capacity or whatever. Um, it's 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 basically focused on. Um, providing uh, opportunities uh, for these uh, carpool apps to, uh, to be able to operate. And um, at least the folks that um, um, uh, have initiated this uh, in, along the corridor uh, believe that, that um, it will encourage um, congestion reduction. So there might be a little bit of a capacity and Rich, it's actually there. the next one, the, it's the next two, not the carpooling one, sorry. Oh, it's not the carpooling, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking at all these numbers on this page too. <laughs> yeah. So are you looking at 1196? So we just did 1186, that's the RTD one. Yeah, 1196 and, and yeah. 1196 is yeah. really just mm -hmm. the, a classic technical cleanup. Okay. I'm sure there will be more changes. It seems like everything is sort of changing by day. And I, I'm right. curious to hear what comes out of tomorrow's information yeah. and how that impacts this. And that's really the, the key. And, and as, as we mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll discuss that as soon as we get to the bills. So <laughs> that's what everybody's interested in. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. I don't need to pull anything, Director Stoltzman. I just wanted to get some clarification on that. Thank you, Rich. And yeah, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Director Sankran. Director Moldy. Hi, thank you. Question on uh, HB 1121, um, the eviction procedures. Does that apply to all landlords? There were some concerns with the original anti-eviction procedural bills. They didn't mm -hmm. apply to certain situations. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to double check uh, and get back to you, but I do believe there is a, a, a lower limit um, like, you know, if you're a landlord of, I, I don't want to say exactly, but, you know, one or two or three uh, properties or units, um, you're, I think you're exempt from this, but I could get back to you with the clarification on that. Thank you. It's a, it's a concern, but I don't think it would impede support. So I don't wish to pull it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mulvey. And so that will take us to discussion on um, House Bill 1205. And so, Rich, if you'll just resummarize just really briefly for us what that is, and then we'll turn it back over to yeah, Director Rocket yeah. to start the conversation. Uh, sure. 1205 relates to um, imposing an annual 
registration uh, fee uh, or a fee added to annual registration um, on um, plug-in electric motor vehicles, um, uh, I guess ostensibly to um, increase how much they pay and their, pay more of their fair share since they don't buy gas. Thank you, Director Brackett. Yeah, well, I'd just like for us to consider taking an opposed position rather than a monitor position yeah. to this, um, because I think as we generally know that electric vehicles are an important tool in our toolkit for uh, reducing pollution, uh, meeting our air quality goals, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think the amount of revenue generated by this would be um, very incremental. So I know we need all the fun funding we can get for our transportation system. But I think there are other ways that we're going to accomplish that. And I'll also note that um, the fee is an estimated amount. So unlike the gas tax, where you do actually pay proportional for the amount you use the roads, uh, if you drove your car for your electric vehicle for 100 miles a year, I believe you'd pay the same amount as if you drove it for you know, 100,000 miles a year. So it, it seems like it's fundamentally flawed. So I'd, I'd like us to consider taking an opposed position. Thank you, Director Brackett. So we will take uh, this one out of the package. So House Bill 1205 will take out and have further discussion and then vote on that one separately. Um, so other folks can weigh in on the position that we should take and not seeing any other hands, if I could get a motion to accept the staff recommendation on all the other bills that have been discussed, we can get through that and then move to this next topic. Director Coombs? So moved. And is there a second, Director Gipp? Second. And then is there any discussion of the motion? Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as city council in Denver hasn't had a chance to review these, uh, my intention is to abstain. Um, we will probably end up supporting a lot of them, perhaps opposing some of them. But as of now, I can't speak for the body. Thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. And any other discussion of the motion? And just to clarify, it's to accept the staff recommendation on the positions on the bills with the exception of House Bill 1205, and we'll pull that off and discuss it separately. Director Whitman? Um, I will, too, abstain from voting since council in our city has not reviewed any of these, I'm sure. So I'll abstain from the, from the vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. Director Shaw? Uh, the town of Superior will abstain for the same reasons laid out earlier. Thank you. Director Kraft Tharp? Jefferson County will abstain for the same reasons. Thank you. Thank you. And just um, this will help me only have to do my math one time. Are there any other folks who are planning on abstaining so I can just make sure that we have a quorum? This is Anita from Westminster. I'll be abstaining as well. And Bob Piper from Arbetta. And Dave Trevor from Greenwood Village. And Holly Rogan from Lyons. All right, you guys. And just remember that um, we'll be doing this each month. And so um, the bills come out really late and we try to get them to everybody as early as we possibly can so they have a chance to take them back to their communities. Um, and the way some communities do it is make uh, policy statements that can be applied in a number of situations like the board of directors has so that we can take positions on things. So let me just count this up really quick. All right, so that's 29. And that we have a quorum and I just need to make sure we have uh, 10. All right, so all those in favor? of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. The position um, carries, the motion carries. So we've given staff direction on those bills and that'll take us to the discussion on House Bill 1205, the electric vehicle registration fee. Is there any other discussion from members? Director Teal. Well, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to shift it to support because I actually do appreciate that this seems to be one of the first um, efforts by the legislature to pursue a, a form of uh, revenue funding for transportation that is not reliant on the gas tax. Uh, although, I mean, I do appreciate um, Councilmember Brocken's 
uh, comments, though, in that, yeah, this, this does inherently remove an incentive that has been there for electric vehicle use. Um, heck, we owned a, uh, a hybrid electric vehicle for nine years and uh, made use of some of the incentives when we first bought it. So um, uh, uh, I'll hold off on a motion to support uh, directly in opposition to my friend, Aaron. Um, but uh, actually I, I would urge that we maintain the monitor until we see further development on this. Thank you, Director Teal. And I'll just um, make a comment and it may be a little out of order, so I appreciate the latitude that you're all allowing me. There is one other discussion topic, which is this bill that Director Sandgren brought up, which is a transportation funding bill that I think we all know is in the background that will come out at some point in time. <laughs> the date keeps changing. And so I think we all, uh, I just wanna make sure everyone has that equal information that there will likely be another bill that's not listed here that comes out at some point in time around transportation funding that will have any number of different types of perhaps fees or other charges uh, to raise revenue. So I just want everybody to have that equal information while we have this discussion. Director Mulvey. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm torn on this one as well and prefer the monitor position. And the, the reason I would not want to go with oppose is several fold. EVs, we do want to keep the incentive, no doubt. Um, but the damage that an EV causes to the road by virtue of weight does call for an addition. As more we get more EVs, they're, they're actually heavier and we're gonna need more road work as a result. And I, it's not something that's spoken of a lot. People don't always do the math on it, but the EVs by virtue of their weight actually cause a little bit more damage to the roadway, especially if you're looking at asphalt. So secondly, the thing that concerns me is that a lot of times we think only of EVs in terms of the fact that they're going to you know, reduce greenhouse emissions and that's true, but you know, we, we have to have parity you know, and there's all users need to be charged equally and that, that concerns me. And when, when there's a disparate treatment to, for the people who can afford an EV, that doesn't, that doesn't ring well with me. So I would prefer to keep it as monitor and not to um, go in favor of uh, Mr. Brockett's motion. Thank you, Director Coombs. Um, I would support Director Brockett's motion um, simply because I agree that we need to increase electric vehicle use um, and continue to incentivize that kind of unrelated, but on the topic of EVs, um, I do want to also raise though, that there is an accessibility concern, both for charging infrastructure and for vehicle modifications for people with disabilities um, in adopting electric vehicle use. So that's perhaps an against, but more so just something we need to address. Thank you. Um, Director Levy. Um, thank you. I um, actually want to join in support of Director Brockett's uh, request that we move to a, an opposed position um, for for a slightly different reason. And I think you, um, Chairman Stolzman, sort of alluded to this, which is that we are going to see a bill that's um, going to um, take a much broader approach to transportation funding that's going to account for the fact that EVs uh, don't contribute to the gas tax and the HUTF through the gas tax and, and try to take a more comprehensive approach. And the concern would be having, having this standalone piecemeal bill out there that um, charges, you know, tries to impose some sort of a charge uh, and, and then have this other bill layered on and it would be better to take a more coordinated approach. I think also it would be good um, to what, uh, have a, a better, well, do what an existing charge actually allows for, which is have part of the fee go to the HUTF pursuant to that allocation that we have up there on the screen, but then also 
put some of the revenue generated into EV charging infrastructure so that we can actually facilitate adoption of EVs. So I think, I think this bill is really well intentioned and I appreciate that we do need to start figuring out how to, um, how to equalize the situation and, uh, and have EVs contribute to funding for road maintenance. But I, I think we ought to try to focus on the larger, more comprehensive uh, bill that we are hoping to see tomorrow. Thank you. Director Shaw. Thank you. Uh, I speak in favor of monitoring this bill for the time being. Uh, it allows us to not take a position one way or another and to, to watch as this bill evolves. I think there's some advantage to that because we can help form the uh, direction that the bill moves in if, if need be or if new legislation comes along that uh, is more comprehensive, it gives us the opportunity to uh, support, oppose, or monitor that one as well. I, I would also say that uh, I fully support incentives to make the purchase of a, an, electron, an electric vehicle. Um, but to Director Mulvey's point that there are ongoing maintenance costs um, generated by cars uh, rolling down the roads and EVs are some of that population, um, they should begin to, to pay their own way. I had heard there was some sort of a pilot that some group was going to play a, pay a flat fee Others would test uh, on miles driven. So again, another reason that perhaps we should monitor and to the extent we can guide the evolution of this bill, there's an advantage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Director Dale? Yes, I have real concern when we don't take mileage into consideration. I have a couple of, if I just use myself as an example, I got a couple of vehicles and they haven't gone very many miles for a while, but in, until you're having some equity on mileage, I don't see uh, a rationale for supporting this. I understand monitoring because this, I don't think this bill will fly anyhow, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm not opposed to a fee, but I think it has to be equitable about Mile mileage and our whole gas tax situation is a mess anyhow, but I don't see any reason to support it and I'm moderately in favor of monitor and more in favor of opposing. Thank you, Director Dale. Director Starker? Thank you. Uh, I'm in favor of monitoring this bill at this time so that we sort of keep our powder dry for when the um, when the, the greater transportation bill uh, comes out in a, in a little while. Uh, I would favor uh, initial incentives for uh, getting electric vehicles on the road. Uh, I would hope that at some point we, uh, we don't have gasoline powered vehicles, but I think in moving to that future, we need to have uh, developed some type of a model for the, uh, uh, for the impact that EVs have on our roadways and provide an equitable way for them to share in that, uh, in the in the long term uh, participation in the highway system. Thank you. Thank you, Director Kerber. I would uh, lean toward Director Shaw and Director Mulvey and, and their concerns about uh, potential damages to the road. But more importantly, uh, we'd lean toward monitoring because we looks like we're only seeing a piece of the transportation puzzle. The rest of the pieces will come in tomorrow. So. I don't think it hurts us to monitor for uh, for a month or so, um, as opposed to taking a, a solid position right now. So I would I would uh, vote for uh, monitoring. Thank you, Director Shaw. Uh, thanks. Um, the town of Spear again probably won't take a position on it right now. However, um, we have a large number of Tesla owners within the town that would probably be very much in. You know, not in favor of the bill as it's written right now. As a longtime EV owner, uh, I've got about 50,000 miles and I'm on my third set of tires. So to what Director Mulvey had suggested earlier, uh, the wear and tear from the, the EVs is significantly different than cars. But the flip side, my dad has the same car as I do and he put on 5,000 miles in last year. So, you know, I think a one size fit all does not fit all. 
Um, and I do prefer monitoring this as we sort of, as it sort of evolves over time to factor in usage as we do with other um, types of transportation. Thank you. Director Maurer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm in favor of staying with monitoring for right now. Um, you know, there's a, you're hearing things about a number of various fee proposals bills out there. And uh, I just think I don't want to discourage the use of EV users at this time. So thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank all the directors for a really robust, um, respectful, and good discussion uh, and deliberation this evening. It's fantastic. And um, so I don't see any other hands. And we actually don't have a motion on the floor. So if someone would like to raise their hand and make a motion for the group to consider, um, after hearing all of that and considering all of the comments that were made, I will entertain that and in the order they came in. And then uh, I just wanna let everybody know with my count, if the same exact group of people abstains as abstains before, uh, then we would need fewer than 11 people to vote no. So we would need the balance to vote yes. If I didn't describe that well, I'm happy to for everyone, but I have a count of eight people who abstained last time. And on these legislative positions per our uh, bylaws, we have to have, um, uh, I'm sorry, now I have nine. I just got a text in. I have nine abstentions now. Um, so I'll do the math again, which I think will change it to 10 uh, to 11 no votes. In any case, in our bylaws, it says we have to have two thirds of the members that are present and voting. So the abstentions get factored out in order to take a position on these legislative issues. Um, so I will double check the math, but in the meantime, we will take uh, a motion. And the first hand that was raised was Director Brockett. Yeah, well, uh, just from the comments, it sounds like a, a motion to oppose would be unsuccessful. So I don't need us to go through the exercise. I appreciate people entertaining the discussion um, I think I'll leave the point on the table that I think disincentivizing electric vehicles is not the direction we want to go in, but uh, we do have some larger pieces of the funding puzzle coming online. Um, so I look forward to talking about it further at our next meeting in a month. Thank you. And um, Director uh, Shaw had her hand up to per perhaps make a motion to frame the discussion further. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would move to uh, maintain a position of monitor on House Bill 1205. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. And then further discussion, Director Teal. Hand raised for the purpose of making a second. Thank you very much. And Director Gip, I saw your hand was up for a moment. Just want to confirm you didn't have an additional comment. Same second. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and so if there is no further discussion of the motion. I'll just wait a second for people to raise their hands. The motion would be to take a position for the Dr. Cogsford to take a position of monitor on House Bill 1205 at this time. So um, if I could have the people abstaining just raise their hands so I can confirm that my list is accurate, that would help me out. Great. All right, so Piper. We're getting there. Can I get a reminder on how to raise hands here? <laughs> there, so there at the bottom of the screen, there should be a raise hand button. In some of the uh, applications, if you've downloaded a desktop version, you will have to click reactions and then there's a raise hand feature. And in some, you'll have to pop out the participant panel. And then on the bottom right hand side, there's a raise hand button. But I know that was Nicholas and I'll add you to my list. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yeah, you're an engineer. Madam Chair? Yes. I'm an English major. <laughs> Director Flynn. Thank you. I'm, I'm raising my real hand here because I didn't want to raise Perfect. my personal one. Perfect. <clears throat> uh, All right. So I, I have, a, I have yeah, an accurate count of the- I'm saying, Madam Chair, I'm saying because the motion is to monitor, which is the position that was recommended, that I would vote yes and continue to monitor uh, I, since we're not taking a position pro and con. So I'm not, uh, I'm not abstaining on this. I would vote yes to continue to monitor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director Flynn. All right, so that does change my count ever so slightly, and I appreciate that clarification. And I have the other abstentions down for the minutes. Thank you very much. And so with that, all those uh, in favor of monitoring House Bill 1205, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposition? 
Thank you, everyone. And with that, I'll turn it to Executive Director Rex to tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, the discussion around potential bill on fees and charges. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jen, did you want to go first? Oh, I apologize, Ooh. Jen. We had laid nope. out that you were next. I sincerely apologize. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> No, 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 that is okay. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Director Stoltzman. And, um, you know, unfortunately, my my update is going to be fairly straightforward and probably very disappointing <laughs> to you all, um, as I don't have any further specifics um, on what we can expect to see tomorrow. Um, I think what, what we know and what we can assume is going to be in the transportation bill that, or the transportation plan that's going to be unveiled tomorrow um, with the legislative uh, leaders, Representative Gray and Senator Winter, as well as the governor, um, is going to be very much aligned with what we've heard already. And that includes you know, a variety of new fees, some increased fees. Um, there'll be a, a, a large focus on multimodal and um, transit type of options. Um, but tomorrow is really when, when we're gonna see what the proposed structure of, of transportation funding is going to look like what uh, fees are coming and how much those fees are. Um, so tomorrow I imagine will be, will be quite an interesting day. So, so hopefully, you know, Doug or Director Solzman, you'll be able to go. I did get a commitment from the legislative sponsors of the transportation bill that they do wanna work with us moving forward on this piece of legislation. So we'll remain in close contact with them. And I believe we can expect to see a bill in one to two weeks, uh, knock on wood here. Uh, we'll, we'll see if that happens. The other thing I, I did want to mention briefly, uh, Doug, is also just to say Ed had alluded to this with the, the governor's stimulus package that there is a request in there for $170 million for shovel ready projects um, along the I-70 mountain corridor. Um, so, so those projects can expect um, some funding um, to come their way. So with that, uh, Doug, I can certainly send it back over to you. Thank you very much. And I don't have a whole lot more to add either. Um, we do believe, based on conversations we heard, that EV infrastructure, there will probably be a set aside, or at least at one time has been talked about, and a set aside for EV infrastructure. Um, we are aware of Metro Mayor Cox's proposal and the conversations that they're having and their desire to get a larger share back to, to the metro area. Uh, we, as with regards to the uh, the uh, the new funding that would be generated from these fees, but other than that, um, you know, it's just been it's been an, a lot of a lot of he said she said type of thing right now. So I hopefully we'll get a little bit more clarity tomorrow. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. And uh, with these virtual meetings come a number of surprises and uncertainties and mistakes. And so I just, uh, we, we normally wouldn't take public comment at this time, but I noticed there's a dial-in number in the um, audience list. And so I'm just going to unmute the member to ensure that it's not one of the board of directors, directors trying to participate by phone. And so um, I'm allowing the person with the phone number ending in 396 to be able to speak. Um, because your hand is raised and you'll have to unmute yourself and then let us know if you are one of our fellow directors. We can hear you. Hi. All right, well, um, we were unable to hear you, but we could hear that you were unmuted. So I apologize sincerely if it is a director and um, please email me um, or call me on my cell phone between meetings and we'll make sure we work out any technical difficulties before the next board meeting. And with that, um, that ends our legislative issues and new bills for consideration action. And it takes us to our informational briefings. Um, so we have committee reports this evening and the first one is from the staff. And so I wanted to let everyone know that the staff made a recommendation supporting the Safe Route to School applications on to the Transportation Commission. And the really good news is four of the five applications um, submitted by our jurisdiction in the Dr. Cog region are being recommended for funding. So that is excellent news. And it, it goes again to some previous comments of board members that we, we really need our communities to apply to these different pools of funding if we want to be awarded the funds. And those Safe Route school funds make a huge difference in getting um, the kids safely to school. 
We also uh, took action recommending supporting the 1601 interchange approval pro uh, process policy. And if you have questions about that, I will turn it over to staff for clarification. We also got an update on the budget overview. Um, there was a little bit more money than had been expected. And so um, instead of the previous gap, the unallocated uh, supplemental STDG funds will fill the gap rather than further program reductions that I reported on last month. And we got an update on Senate Bill 267 third year funding. And um, our Dr. Cog staff have asked to have uh, further discussion with CEDA offline prior recommendations just to ensure that it is the highest priority projects and programs as identified by our areas. Um, and we really appreciate that CDOT has been keeping an eye on equity targets with both respect to the highway programs and the multimodal program to ensure that we each get our fair share um, from that pool. And last, uh, the group took um, an emergency position. Uh, so our bylaws state that we will get packets of information sent to us a week ahead of time. Uh, but 20, 24 hours and 10 minutes before the meeting, the packet was posted with an emergency item to take action on uh, statewide transportation needs. Uh, really just a statement saying that any new funding source ought to be um, targeted at statewide improvement. And just because of the short timing and lack of action from our board, I have been from that. Thank you. And that takes us to a report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Director Sparker. Madam Chair, I'm pleased to report on the Metro Mayor's Caucus had their last meeting on March 4th. We had a uh, report from the Transportation Mobility uh, Committee talking about uh, potential legislation uh, in the, uh, in the legislature this year and how we might react to that. We had a report on uh, front range passenger rail from uh, Spencer Dodge and the uh, various forms and directions that that may be taking. And we had a briefing uh, on uh, tomorrow's Metro Denver Regional uh, convening on homelessness uh, with uh, MDHI that's tomorrow morning. And I hope that you and or some of your staff can join that meeting. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. We have a report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Actually, I haven't seen Director Baker on. And so I will ask if another um, commissioner that's in NAC attended, if they could give an update. And if not, we will turn to the next time. Director Teal, I saw you on mute. I bet you Commissioner Odorizio has a great report to give. Uh, I don't have I don't have much of a report other than we uh, we're we're rebooting the year or just starting up the year and uh, excited to get everyone together. Um, not in person, of course, not yet, but we're working on that eventually. Uh, but Mac is starting to work on identifying uh, for the year the different uh, topics that we're going to address, uh, and a lot of the topics so far have been dealing uh, around mental health, homelessness and some of the things that we've talked about here. So we look forward to working with folks like George Teal and the rest of our friends and family from the Metro Area County Commissioner. So if you have any questions, feel free to send me a text or an email. Take, take care. Thank you for that update on the return of the MAC. Return? So we, of, ooh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, next, we have a report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Jayla? Hi. Um, the Advisory Committee on Aging received a presentation from Lisa Hood and Jacob uh, Rieger on the 2050 Dr. Cog Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and got some really valuable input from the committee. We also had a presentation from Nimble Science. Oh, guys, I'm really excited to tell you about this. It's a, par a new partnership that we've developed uh, and a pilot program. It's to prevent falls and to improve balance. So using an app on any smart device, you can download a free balanced fall prevention program. This is an evidence-based program that combines exercise with fun and easy cognitive games. The combination of these two are what makes this program different and what makes it incredibly effective. You know, Preventing falls is super important because it's the number one cause of accidental deaths in older adults. The number one, um, the, among the leading uh, causes of hospitalization and also uh, needing to go to a higher level of care, having to leave your home and go to like an assisted living or a nursing home. So it's really, really important. 
If you or anyone you know that's 60 and older and would like to participate in this, Dr. Cog AAA is going to pay for 5,000 people's membership for one year. Um, and all you have to do is type in Nimble, N Y M B L. And you'll see a little screen that says if uh, you want to sign up, you can get Nibble now and Dr. Cog will pay for it. Pretty exciting. Thank you so much. That is awesome. Next, we have a report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Direct, uh, Executive Director X. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the last RAC meeting was on March 5th, and we had a legislative update similar to this, talking about the accelerated session and everything that's going to be that's going to come with that. But the, um, the, we spent the largest amount of time on a conversation about uh, the proposed employer-based trip reduction program. A little bit of background on this, that the, the RAC originally, um, they re originally set up a work group to talk about the employer trip, trip reduction program associated with our pending um, moving from serious to severe non-attainment and everything that comes with that. And of course, because Dr. Cog, as well as our TMA partners, we, uh, we have a voluntary program in place right now um, dealing with, uh, with employer trip reduction program. So that, you know, so that's how it originally started. And then it's kind of been morphed into it um, and, and now being considered a mitigation strategy for greenhouse gas emissions in response to 12, uh, um, possible 1261. And um, so CDPHE at this state has basically, you know, has kind of co-opted and take, taken over kind of the direction of that group. Um, we are still participating. Um, what is proposed right now is that this uh, employer ship reduction program would be mandated by, by, uh, by rulemaking um, with possible rulemaking in the August timeframe. We are, we are hoping and, uh, to get uh, someone from CDPHE staff to present to uh, the board at either our April work session or our regular April meeting. So stay tuned on that. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. E-470, Director Dyack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our um, E-470's uh, last meeting was March 11th. Uh, we, had, uh, we had two departmental um, agenda topics, if you will. Uh, the first one, IT, we, we reviewed and approved six contracts primarily regarding back office rewrite, as well as security incident management to ensure safety and efficiency in operations. Any questions or comments, please contact the IT board guru, Commissioner Teal. Um, the, the other theme is engineering. We have, uh, we, uh, we reviewed a toll plaza redevelopment proposal. Um, we have four service areas, which used to be our old toll, our, our old toll plaza areas. Um, we are going to um, uh, allow a, a, a Dublin, Ireland company uh, by the name of Apple Green uh, develop four service areas, a public process, uh, two in Commerce City, one in Aurora, one in Parker. And we also did a timely uh, review on our snow removal. That is all, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, we'll have a report from CDOT. Director White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as is often the case, the, the report out from Stack is a, a good summary of what's before the department, but I'll just offer uh, updates on a few more things. Uh, just to emphasize the, our uh, preparedness and excitement around receiving the third year of Senate Bill 267 dollars. We are expecting uh, that issuance sometime in April or May. As a reminder for the board, that is a uh, certificates of, of uh, participation. Uh, proposal. So that's how that's funded. Those go out to the market and we don't quite know yet the exact money we receive until that has gone out into the market. But we're working with the state treasurer on that and are looking at scenarios around $500 million for that third issuance. Um, also, I, I mentioned earlier the $30 million we received from the state legislature to expand the safer main streets concept statewide along with the revitalizing Main Streets program, which is really focused on COVID resiliency, helping communities move into street spaces and make other changes so that people can space out and still support the economy. So we're very excited about that. Um, speaking of stimulus, I just wanna make a, a clarification. I think it was mentioned earlier that there's a, a proposal out now um, that the leadership and the governor announced last week 
uh, for an additional 170 million for state stimulus for transportation. That is not just specific to the I-70 mountain corridor. There are a number of projects mentioned um, as priorities for that funding, including the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel, some bridge work, um, but it would, it would not be only for the I-70 mountain corridor. So I just thought that was an important clarification. Uh, the last couple things I'll mention, obviously CDOT was very busy over the past weekend. Uh, we will uh, be totaling up our total effort over the next few weeks, but it, it looks like the amount of deployment and, uh, and uh, plowing we needed to do exceeded uh, the bomb cyclone, which was our last major snow event. Um, but just really appreciate the, all the Coloradans who uh, stayed home, bowed to the plow and, and did their best to, to make sure we could get out there and plow the road. Lastly, um, I appreciate the board's involvement as CDOT looks at the greenhouse gas um, planning rule. Um, this is also one of the recommendations coming out of the greenhouse gas roadmap, uh, which would look at setting a, a budget for transportation plans. Had the opportunity to present to the board work session earlier this month and, and just really appreciate the ongoing participation by uh, Ron Papsdorf, uh, Director Spolson, Director Maurer as we go through that process. That's it for me tonight, thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, we'll have a report on fast tracks from Bill Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. At the February RTD board planning capital programs and fast tracks committee meeting, the committee recommended approval of an equitable transit oriented development policy, which was formally adopted later that month, last month. And then at the RTD board's February study session, RTD staff presented an item on the status of the Northwest Rail Corridor. It included a look at the Fast Tracks history and current status of Fast Tracks, including all of the unfinished corridors in Fast Tracks. It included a deep dive on the Northwest Rail Corridor and current status of that corridor, as well as a review of the 2019 unfinished corridors report and a look at federal funding and other partnership opportunities. So the focus of that study session was regarding the Northwest Rail and particularly the peak service plan, which is three trips from Longmont through Boulder to Denver Union Station in the AM peak and three return trips in the PM peak, which is seen as a lower cost alternative that may present opportunities to accelerate the completion date. So that study session was well attended and the governor was able to drop in providing strong words of support for moving the project forward. At that meeting, RTD's general manager, Deborah Johnson indicated that RTD staff will present some next step recommendations to the RTD board no later than April 30th, um, 2021. There was no RTD board planning capital program and fast tracks committee meeting in March. The next meeting of that committee is scheduled for April 6th. That concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And that takes us to our informational items on the agenda you'll find in attachment G in the packet. Um, some TIP administrative modifications. If you have any questions about that, please reach out to staff. Our next meeting is April 21st, 2021. Are there any other matters by members this evening? Director Teal. So just a informational comment for Doug. Uh, Doug, uh, I, I did not receive the beer delivery from Jacob Rieger for tonight's meeting. <laughs> uh, I just didn't I don't know. know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> committed to it in a prior meeting, man. I, I just wanted you to know. Thank you, Thank Director you, Madam Chair. It is fun to have fun. Thank you, Director Teal. <laughs> Director Rogan. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a point of clarification. Um, I didn't hear the, the additional TIP funding for the Lions projects mentioned, so I wanted to make sure that there were no further steps that we need to take. My Executive Director Rex. Not that I'm aware of. I um, I think the questions. I'll turn. I'll 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 direct the question to uh, 
Ron Papsdorf. I think the question is just generally, so we've met in our sub-regional forums and had the discussions around the transportation improvement program with the additional funds. Are there any additional steps that need to be taken by any of the communities? And in this case, particularly Lyons. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Stolzman, uh, Ron Papsdorf here. I know Todd Cottrell has been working with all of the sub-regional forums um, around the region, uh, working on finalizing recommendations. Many of the sub-regional forums have completed their recommendations. There's, uh, there's some outstanding work to be done, I think, for Arapahoe County Forum and maybe Adams, but uh, things have been changing pretty quickly and things are coming together um, pretty as recently as, as yet today. So I don't think that we need anything else from Lions, but I'll follow up with Todd Cottrell and make sure that everything is squared away. But I believe that the Boulder County uh, forum recommendations are, are complete now. We will be packaging up all of the recommendations that come forward from the sub-regional forums um, as one action item and recommendation to the full board at your April um, board meeting. Terrific, thank you so very much. You're welcome. Thank you, are there any other matters by members? All right, seeing none, now we can all start celebrating. Have a good evening, everyone, and see you in a month. Thanks, have a good night. Good night. Thanks, good night. everyone. Good night. 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 Good job, Ashley. <laughs>